Okay, I think I think we're going to go ahead and start. And uh, I can see it's a it's a full house here. Um, you know, I would tell people to come in and sit in more on the inside, but it's totally crowded in there. So I'm sorry about this. This is the only room that was available for this talk, and I thought getting a much bigger room was going to make it a little bit less uh, intimate. So this is the best we could do. All right, so um, it's my great honor, and it's actually sort of my challenge to introduce Maynard Olson tonight. Um, and the reason it's both an honor and a challenge is because Maynard's had such a prolific career that it's really pretty hard to know where to start in terms of talking about his career highlights. Um, but, um, but Maynard's actually made it a little bit easier for me because I, I asked him to send me a copy of CV, and, and that was overwhelming. And he, but he also sent me a really short narrative, which made it really great because it hit all the highlights. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to use that as m in my introduction. Um, so Maynard's undergraduate uh, career uh, was at Caltech. He got his PhD in chemistry at Stanford. He then joined the, the faculty here at UW in 1992 um, after short faculty careers at, um, at basically Dartmouth and Washington University. Um, he's currently professor emeritus in the Department of Medicine and Genome Sciences. And uh, the reason you guys are all here is because Maynard is actually very well known for his contributions to the Human Genome Project. And in particular, Maynard served on the original National Research Council Committee on Mapping and Sequencing of the Human Genome and the National Advisory Council of the National Human Genome Research Institute. He also testified about the, um, the Genome Project before uh, congressional committees. And, um, and through these activities, he basically played a major role in helping to shape uh, the strategy and the direction the Human Genome Project went. And then more recently, he served on the National Research Council Committee on Precision Medicine. And I think he'll probably talk a little bit about his thoughts on that topic tonight. Uh, in addition to these activities, Maynard's lab also played a really instrumental role, a set of roles in, in developing some of the strategies that were used to map and sequence the human genome. So as a result of these contributions, Maynard's received many awards and many honors over the years. I'm, I can only mention but a few. Uh, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. He received the Genetic Society of America Medal in 1992. The City of Medicine Award in 2000, the Gardner International Award in 2002, and the Gruber Genetics Prize in 2007. So lastly, I also want to mention, in addition to his international contributions to the Human Genome Project, uh, Maynard's also had an enormous impact on the scientific community here in Seattle. Uh, and um, in particular, I think he was one of the major architects in the formation of the Genome Sciences Department uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's actually the one who coined the, the, the name of our department, Genome Sciences. Um, and so basically, for those of you old enough to remember the old E.F. Hutton commercial that always ended um, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Uh, to, to my <laughs> mind, that's, that's kind of how I think, that, I, think, um, I think Maynard is kind of the genetics version of E.F. Hutton. I mean, when Maynard speaks, people listen. I, I think if you know Maynard, you know that I'm right about that. Uh, however, now I don't know that much about E.F. Hutton. But, uh, but Maynard is not, is by no means a one-dimensional guy. Uh, if Maynard has thought about a subject, it doesn't matter whether it's genetics or ballet or you name it, he's going to have something interesting to say about it. Um, so um, it's a, it's, he's a really fascinating individual. It's always interesting to listen to him talk. And we're really lucky to have him here this evening. I don't have to repeat his title. He's right up there. So without further ado, Maynard Olson. <laughs> So let's try out the microphone. Uh, thanks, Leo. That's a uh, challenging introduction to follow, and <laughs> and this is certainly a challenging audience. Uh, it is uh, intimate circumstances. Make yourselves as comfortable as possible. Sit on the floor, whatever. Uh, at least until the fire marshal shows up. <laughs> uh, this is uh, is an extremely challenging audience. Uh, to deal with, since it uh, has everyone from the chairman of medicine and uh, genome sciences, uh, many of my senior colleagues are in it, to uh, high school students and uh, and members of the public who took seriously the the uh, department's sort of advertisement that these lectures are accessible to uh, people without any prior background in genomics or other areas of biology. So uh, spanning this range will be challenging. How, how many high school students do we have here? Quite a good group. As, uh, so that's great. I don't have a lot of opportunities to talk to high school students, but I'll try
try to direct a few of my comments in your direction. Uh, and I'll count on my uh, colleagues to bail me out if I get in trouble. I'm amongst friends, and there are people here who know more about any particular thing that I'm going to talk about uh, than I do. So, this financial disclosure is on, on the Scientific Advisory Board of Illumina, which, as many of you know, is a market leader in providing uh, genome sequences, gen genome sequencing instrumentation and uh, reagents. So, I'd like to dedicate these comments to uh, my colleague, uh, Arno Matulski. Uh, he had hoped to be here this evening, but was unable to be. Uh, and perhaps for the high school students, I'll just say a word or two about my interactions with him. Uh, first of all, uh, young scientists often uh, are concerned about what they should major in, what they should focus on, a lot of choices to be made at a stage when you don't know too much. And uh, I'd like to reassure you, there's always time to learn. Um, I have no background in medicine, uh, not much in biology. But uh, there are many opportunities in rich university environments to uh, expand your skills. Arno has been my primary mentor in uh, medicine. Uh, starting in the mid-1990s, I had lunch with him a couple of times a month. Uh, went on for 15 years, and over the period I gradually learned a few things uh, about medicine from the master. So when he was interviewed uh, a few years ago in the New York Times, uh, he uh, gave one of his typically skeptical comments, uh, what we know about the genome today is not enough for all the miracles many expect from this field. Uh, Arno and I are one of our bonds, as we're both uh, skeptics. The situation is... Uh, however, changing and changing quite rapidly. Uh, in the last, uh, I would say, two years, uh, a clear corner has been turned in the interplay between genomics and medicine. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of the interaction between this basic science field and, uh, and the clinic. Uh, but now you're actually starting to see uh, serious engagement uh, between genomics and medicine. And so tonight I'm going to try to provide a basic scientist's view of uh, what that's about and where perhaps we could go from here. Uh, as Leo indicated, uh, sort of a policy sense, my background goes back to the early days of the Human Genome Project. I served on this committee, which was chaired by uh, Bruce Alberts. And uh, I'm going to talk a little later about the sort of hype problem that genomic medicine has suffered from from the beginning. Uh, but the beginning was certainly not this report, uh, which was an influential sort of basic uh, outline of how this project might proceed and, uh, and what, what the rationale was for carrying it out. This, I think, was about the most extravagant statement uh, in the entire report. I think that there's, uh, there's no question that uh, the Human Genome Project has been evident for uh, a decade or more that it has greatly enhanced progress in human biology. It's indisputable. And uh, so my message tonight is that it is actually starting to deliver progress in medicine. Uh, but I think that there are many challenges, uh, scientific, uh, clinical, and policy-wise, uh, to take advantage of this sort of turning point in the kind of history of basic science and medicine. So, taking seriously the notion that we need to, to uh, get back to the fundamentals of, uh, of biology, uh, using this uh, drawing, which I, I did myself. <laughs> <coughs> well, remind uh, uh, people that uh, most uh, human cells uh, contain uh, two nearly identical three billion long strings of the DNA monomers, G, T, A, and C. Uh, these, uh, I say, are nearly identical because in a sort of typical outbred population such as ours, uh, they're about 99.9% .9 identical. And much of our discussion tonight will involve the minor differences uh, between different instances of the genome. Uh, as far as the very basic biology background uh, goes, uh, some of my comments will require a sort of a basic understanding of what genomes do. 
This is a standard uh, textbook schematic. Uh, and the, the really key point uh, is that uh, the double helix at the top, the genome, uh, is this long string, GTA, G, C, 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 T, and so forth, three billion uh, letters, that uh, it has a rather complex organization as indicated by these uh, exons, introns, and uh, other features. Uh, there are quite complex mechanisms uh, that uh, in, are involved in uh, implementing this information, uh, largely in uh, the form of protein sequences and protein structures. So the sort of basic background that's uh, required tonight is that the order of these monomers in the DNA polymer uh, specify by a, a complex uh, set of processes that are reasonably well understood compared to much of the rest of what uh, I'll have to discuss tonight. Uh, the order of the more chemically diverse monomers and proteins and its uh, proteins that are the sort of uh, main functional elements in cells that make up the sort of structures and uh, biochemical functions in cells. I'm going to say uh, a few words uh, toward the end of the talk about drug development and the interplay between genomic medicine and uh, development of new uh, pharmaceuticals. And uh, there, really, the, the main lesson adequate for tonight's discussion is that uh, most small molecule drugs, which is what I'm going to be talking about, drugs that come in pills, uh, usually taken orally, uh, most small molecule drugs work uh, by interfering with the function of particular proteins in cells. The small molecules bind to the proteins in some way that interferes with their function. Uh, an important point that, uh, that whose significance will become clear as I go on uh, is that most mutations, sort of random changes in the uh, genome sequence, if they do anything uh, functionally, also uh, interfere with the synthesis of proteins at their appropriate levels or in their appropriately functional form. And that, that parallel is something to, uh, to keep in mind as we uh, dig deeper into how it is we're going to use genomics to uh, improve uh, health outcomes. Uh, so a key point in this sort of view of genomic medicine uh, is that uh, the whole endeavor is about interpreting these idiosyncratic features of an individual's genome sequence in the service of improving medicine's sort of traditional goals, prognostication, di diagnostics, and therapeutics. Uh, so the problem to a bioinformatician you know, looks something like this. So these are, these are real data, and deference to Mary Claire King, who's here tonight, this little chunk of the BRCA1 gene, which she no doubt can recognize. It, uh, <laughs> this is a, a little over 1,000 of the GAs, Ts, and Cs, and the gene as a whole is uh, more like 100,000 of these, but I'm sure she knows them, uh, at least in their common order, uh, from memory. And, uh, so I colored a C out in the middle there, red, just to, to, to set the stage for genomic medicine, is that uh, one is constantly looking at a sequence which is nearly identical to one that you've seen before, but has some odd change. Let's say that most people have a G there, and uh, this person has a C, and the question is, what significance does that have uh, for human health? So, for example, for the high school students uh, here, I encourage you to tackle problems of this type with, a, with an approximately AP level of just biological background. Uh, you actually could go on the web and come up with a rather intelligent uh, estimate of whether that alteration was likely to increase the uh, susceptibility of the individual with this genome uh, to breast cancer. And uh, if anyone wants to take up this challenge, uh, send me an email and we see if we can organize a virtual uh, study group. You can find my email address easily. And in fact, if you can't find my email address, you need to build, your, build up your web searching school skills because it's, it's, Im it's impossible to be a genomicist without being good at searching the web. Well, it's clear that in most instances, the weak link in this rather abstract uh, structure that I've outlined is uh, our primitive understanding of human biology, particularly at the molecular level. 
a lot of uh, classical medicine uh, was built up at the, at the level of uh, anatomy and physiology and uh, development, uh, organ, tissue level function, uh, and, and much can be done. Uh, but the therapeutic interventions that will be of main interest to us uh, occur at the molecular level, and the issue is whether we understand enough about the molecular processes uh, to make progress. I think it would be fair to say that one reason that surgery has advanced so spectacularly during my lifetime uh, is that these advances could largely be driven at the level of uh, anatomy and physiology and pathology uh, without much knowledge of what the molecular details were. Uh, we now are attempting uh, to, uh, to move sort of molecular medicine uh, more into the center stage. This is not going to happen rapidly, but I actually believe it will happen and will outline my thoughts on that subject. Uh, so, so to a significant degree, genomic medicine is actually attempting to bypass our ignorance of precisely how particular changes in the sequence affect health. That's an important point. It may seem trivial, but it's an important point and one to keep firmly in mind. Uh, there always are two alternatives uh, in, uh, in medicine. The one that we use as a sort of a mental construct of how this whole system is supposed to work is that, is that we uh, study all of the molecular details and understand the biochemistry in great detail, know what molecules are interacting with which others, develop rational kind of ways of inter intervening. Uh, or uh, there is some kind of workaround that we don't have all of that information. Uh, the latter uh, approach has accounted for most success in medicine and, uh, and will, uh, will uh, account for most success going forward, I believe. This is not to say that all that mechanistic information isn't useful. And indeed, I think one of the, the very uh, broad spectrum points about genomics is that it allows us to l leverage uh, what molecular mechanistic information we have uh, spectacularly. And uh, that, uh, I think, is, is one, of the, one of the principal lessons of the genomic era. You, uh, now, anyone who learns that some process that uh, he or she is studying is, is uh, affected by a particular little bit of DNA sequence in the genome, uh, the first thing that one does is to find, well, uh, where does that sequence or sequences like it occur in biology? Uh, what uh, RNA molecules, what DNAs, uh, other places in the human genome or in other species occur? And, and the hope is that somewhere in this web of similarity, uh, you'll come to some solid experimental evidence that uh, this is involved in coding for a protein that does this or that or the other thing, and then work uh, by analogy or what evolutionists call uh, homology, often more powerful, that is, uh, that you assume this similarity as a reflection of uh, long conserved evolutionary processes. But nonetheless, keep in mind uh, that uh, our, uh, this is not a sort of system bi biologist's dream of uh, having highly predictive models of how cells work and so forth. Uh, this is an effort to essentially bypass uh, the extreme difficulty of this problem. And this problem, I firmly believe, will still seem extremely difficult 100 years from now. This is not a problem that lends itself to uh, sweeping uh, resolution. So I've already indicated that each person's genome contains a lot of variation uh, that we uh, know little or nothing about. Indeed, the VUS is kind of the, the central player in genomic medicine, a variant of unknown significance. And, uh, as clinical reports now start to come back, uh, they're full of VUSs, and uh, that's, of course, not what uh, lab medicine uh, uh, physicians want to put on their lab reports, but we have to learn to live with them. I just used an example of an anonymous Korean individual where the genomics happened to have been done with uh, particularly meticulous care, and uh, in this instance, which was fairly typical of what you'd see uh, in, in uh, other uh, populations, other individuals, uh, that... Uh, there were three and a half million differences. Uh, these mostly are substitutions. Uh, there are other things, but they're mostly substitutions. Uh, relative to the arbitrary human reference sequence, which is, can be taken to be more or less a, a representation of, of one arbitrary uh, human genome. <coughs> and uh, about a half million of these had never been seen before. Uh, 
and over 10,000 of them were predicted to actually alter the sequence of the proteins that are made in this individual. And so this just gives an idea of the, the rather massive amount of uh, biochemical individuality that is out there uh, and uh, certainly affects uh, people's health. And these numbers are not changing uh, particularly rapidly. Uh, the, the number that have never been seen before is sort of dropping slowly as we see more and more. Uh, but uh, theory and uh, experience both predict that that number is going to stay high for a very long time. Uh, so, I should really pause for a moment because things are now going to get a little more uh, intricate uh, to see if there are questions at this level. I've, I've tried essentially to outline a, a point of view toward my material so far and then I'm going to tackle the material. Yes? Uh, six billion. So these are the two genomes in this individual, the maternally derived and paternally derived ones. And so it's, uh, we're talking about a little less than one in a thousand of uh, nucleotides in a, any particular genome. Monomers uh, are different. And so my BRCA1 just example was, was to indicate roughly the density at which Variants, mostly of unknown significance, appear in uh, genome sequences. Although once we get some of our uh, students to work uh, on that case, the, its significance uh, may become clear. So I'm going to tackle this uh, large landscape uh, in three parts with uh, a look uh, at diagnostics, and then at therapeutics, and then at policy. I'm going to start with uh, some comments about diagnostics. Diagnostics is traditionally thought of as the strength of genomics because uh, we, uh, in, indeed, it's where the, the idea comes from that, uh, that genomic uh, knowledge is uh, sort of dangerous. It has an oracle-like character that uh, one can peer at these G's, A's, T's, and C's, not know very much, as I've emphasized about why putting a T in this position has some particular effect, perhaps offset by many years, uh, but uh, experience can show that it, it does. And uh, so there's been a worry since the Alberts report that genomics was mostly going to serve to widen the gap between diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, well, diag diagnostics, as I'll emphasize, is obviously critical to medicine. Uh, but uh, physicians don't want to be in a position of diagnosing all kinds of things that they can't do much about. And, uh, and this is a, a burden of genomics, is that it has widened the gap between diagnostics and therapeutics. And I think that policy-wise, uh, this is an issue that requires uh, very close attention. So from the Precision Medicine Report, about which I'll have uh, more to say later, uh, we. Uh, acknowledged firmly that diagnosis is the foundation of medicine. I think I wrote this sentence accurately and precisely defining a patient's condition does not assure effective treatment, but it is unequivocally the place to start. I think no one can argue much with that. And uh, so uh, the, the subtitle of the Precision Medicine Report was sort of toward a new taxonomy of disease, a new way of classifying diseases, and uh, we envision this world with uh, new taxonomy, more accurate diagnoses, targeted treatments, improved health outcomes, and so forth. Uh, should think ambitious thoughts, and uh, just because there are many difficulties is not a reason not to be ambitious. And, uh, so let's start with a, uh, what, what I think can fairly be called a poster child story for uh, genomic diagnostics. Some of you may be uh, familiar with this. I actually, this is the story of the Beery twins. His family has uh, played an important role in uh, sort of waiving their right to privacy and being public advocates for more work of this kind. I heard uh, the mother of these twins uh, speak at a scientific meeting last fall. Uh, so this is a story uh, that uh, mostly uh, unusual in the, uh, the happy outcome, and I don't want to uh, imply that it's in any way typical. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, uh, we need success stories in, uh, in our 
society and medicine and so forth, and they, they have a large impact, and they have a large impact for a reason that one shouldn't be cynical about, a positive reason. Uh, so the, the Berry twins uh, had uh, a difficult start in life with uh, missing their developmental uh, landmarks, uh, having uh, muscle contractions that were not controllable, unclear that they would uh, be able to walk, particularly the girl was the more affected, uh, with this uh, very aggressive, uh, persistent mother. Uh, at, a, at age about five, it was discovered that they had a, a uh, form of dystonia, this muscle uh, disease, which was responsive to dopamine, which is a, a well-established therapeutic in the central nervous system. And they both responded rather uh, impressively to dopamine and uh, were able to, to proceed in school uh, and uh, have a relatively normal uh, early childhood. But by the time they were roughly the age shown here, uh, both of them were encountering kind of a new layers of uh, difficulties. The uh, girl in particular uh, often had difficulty breathing and uh, was uh, unable to exercise vigorously and so forth. The, the boy was losing fine motor control. And, so the mother went on a sort of a new uh, quest that ended with uh, genome sequencing at the uh, Baylor Genome Center, and uh, they discovered uh, that uh, the problem with these twins <laughs> was a mutation in the so-called SPR gene, uh, which is uh, upstream from dopamine, and it explained uh, why they had been responsive to dopamine, uh, but also upstream from serotonin, and uh, so a new, uh, a new therapeutic could, could be fed uh, literally, uh, into these kids, which, uh, which was just below the block in this gene, and, uh, and they both responded uh, spectacularly uh, to this treatment, as indicated in this picture, and are le leading the lives of normal teenagers. So there are some lessons uh, here. Uh, one is that uh, never underestimate uh, the importance of diagnostics in pediatrics including in, in uh, discouraging and difficult pediatric cases. Uh, there have been uh, many studies, talk to any, uh, any pediatric geneticist. I uh, had lunch today with Anita Beck, my former PhD student, who's a, a uh, board-certified pediatrician and geneticist here at Children's, and she uh, reconfirmed that uh, you talk to patients of children that have congenital uh, difficulties and the uh, the parents want a diagnosis. Uh, they're not under the illusion that, that any high fraction of these are going to be another Beery twin uh, story, but they want a diagnosis. Uh, so some of the basics here are that uh, there are about 4 million live births in the U.S. alone, and this is by no means a uniquely uh, American problem, uh, but starting at home, uh, Medically significant congenital problems uh, occur in, in a, a few percent of these newborns, depending on how tight the criteria are for judging the problem to be medically significant. Uh, so we're talking something on the order of 100,000 uh, children a year that uh, come to fairly serious medical attention for what appears to be a, a problem present at birth. Uh, and diagnoses are often elusive. And particularly at a level of detail adequate to guide treatment, establish prognosis, estimate recurrence risk for the parents, and so forth. Uh, that is, many of the diagnoses, uh, you know, autism, just for example, uh, are in one sense well-established medical diagnoses, but they, aren't, they, they, they contribute essentially nothing uh, to guiding treatment and uh, establishing prognosis and so forth. So this is a large, uh, one large, target uh, audience that uh, I think we will see uh, much more intensive use of, of uh, genomics to increase the uh, diagnostic success rate. So this leads, of course, to the question of how often could genome sequencing help? Well, in the current uh, review of this subject, an annual review of genomics and human genetics, this is kind of a brave statement. Uh, I like brave statements. Uh, informal estimates uh, estimate that it would assist diagnosis in something like a quarter of cases, improve uh, management in perhaps 3%. 
and lead to greatly beneficial treatment, maybe 1%. So I was interested in where these numbers came from, and uh, they, they were referenced to a New York Times article uh, <laughs> in which uh, Gina Collada had gone, ra gone around interviewing people, undoubtedly including the authors of this review, uh, <laughs> as to what they thought these numbers were. Uh, obviously, there are serious problems with both the numerator and the denominator in coming up with these numbers. Uh, nonetheless, I've been to enough meetings now, like the personal genomes meeting that uh, Evan Eichler was one of the uh, organizers of last uh, fall at Cold Spring Harbor, and a Gordon conference I was just at uh, in Rhode Island, where a lot of unpublished data was presented by uh, people from academic medical centers that are sort of starting to do this. And I, I think these numbers actually are, are something like in the right ballpark. That is, uh, uh, there is diagnostic success in a, a significant fraction of cases, a minority, but a significant minority. And, uh, and there are uh, an accumulating uh, list of, of examples in which uh, it has uh, sort of direct <coughs> clinical benefit. Uh, just one quote from a, really a primary uh, research source. Uh, Howard Jacobs, a, a rat geneticist, a very basic scientist who's become passionate about this subject at the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, gave, uh, pub published uh, again this year, Science Translational Medicine, a, sort of an overview of how it was going uh, there as they uh, intensified their work in this area. And <coughs> so they are, are getting a significant number of di diagnoses and, uh, that are considered solid. And an important point is that, uh, and this theme comes up repeatedly when you talk to people engaged in this type of work, is that they initially have concerns about cost, data accuracy, uh, the, the quality of the sort of annotation that can be done, all these variants of unknown significance and so forth. Uh, but uh, the major challenges, in their opinion, and I've heard this repeatedly, uh, relate to how clinicians use the data and how patients and their families deal with secondary and incidental findings. This is a major issue in this uh, subject. It's actually a rather major issue throughout medicine, but that's a topic for another night. Uh, we do all these lab tests, we do all this radiology, and we find out all kinds of things uh, that are unrelated to the uh, presenting complaint of the patient. And uh, it's not easy to know what to do with this information. We often don't even really know what it means uh, because uh, the very same radiological lesion uh, that shows up in someone who came uh, for treatment because he had been spitting up blood and had shortness of breath has a different significance than, uh, than in a patient where you happen to catch a glimpse of it when you were checking to see if they had appendicitis. And uh, that requires uh, immensely more data and data of a different kind and so forth than, than we have. Well, the, 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 the genome has been correctly pointed out to be sort of the mother of all source, sources of incidental findings because you, you may be attempting to understand you know, some uh, particular say, muscle uh, disability in a newborn, uh, but you find all kinds of other things, and uh, what do you do about that? Uh, so there are challenges, and uh, in the, at the end of the talk, when I get back to policy concerns, I'll say a word or two about them. So pediatric diagnostics, I believe, will be a, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, it'll be uh, certainly one of the first Areas in which you start to see hundreds of thousands of genomes sequenced uh, in uh, secondary care settings. Uh, and the other area which may even uh, exceed the pediatric uh, diagnostic area is the sequencing of tumors and normal DNA in uh, cancer patients. So this, uh, this figure on the left, very complicated uh, figures from a, a review uh, by Bert Vogelstein, science had a whole special issue on this topic, and uh, the uh, in his uh, kind of overview, uh, he regards about 140 genes have, to have now been identified, which are recurrently and somewhat commonly mutated in cancers, and uh, significantly affect disease progression. So the significantly affect uh, disease progression often involves uh, elements of judgment. Uh, that is, uh, in some cases, we have a very detailed uh, knowledge of, 
of what these mutations do, in other cases less so, and are more reliant just on the uh, correlation uh, between uh, presence of these mutations and behavior of these tumors. Uh, that's quite a, a long list. The, uh, as we know, cancer is an incredibly heterogeneous disease, and it's heterogeneous in all respects, and uh, certainly in terms of the uh, prevalence of these so-called driver mutations. Uh, uh, some cancers uh, have uh, very few. Pediatric cancers typically have very few. There hasn't been enough time in uh, children for a lot of, uh, of these mutations to uh, accumulate in, in their uh, somatic tissues. Uh, the adult cancers are extremely variable. Uh, I'm going to uh, largely rely for my uh, examples on uh, one of the simplest cases, which has been studied very intensively because it's a relatively simple case. It's a acute myeloid leukemia. It has the, the lowest number of, uh, of uh, mutations of this type of any uh, adult cancer that's been uh, carefully studied. And uh, as we'll see, it's uh, amply complicated uh, nonetheless. So here we take the list of the, of the genes, the subset of those 140 genes, which are relatively commonly encountered in mutant form in, uh, in the tumor cells of uh, AML patients. Uh, so each uh, line here is a patient. So this study involved a lot of patients, uh, hundreds. And uh, the connection between uh, one of these bars and one of the others uh, means that, that both of those things were found in that uh, tumor. So the point is that there are some that are more common than others, of course. Uh, uh, there is a very complex kind of combinatoric situation in which you see these driver mutations and different... Uh, different combinations and different tumors. And keep in mind, this is, uh, this is the simplest uh, of the intensively studied adult cancers. Uh, there's no question that the uh, data coming from these studies uh, uh, affects uh, the behavior of the tumor and then particularly therapeutic uh, response. And so here we've done a, a very crude kind of categorization uh, that has taken a a couple of the more common situations on the graph that we just looked at uh, and uh, look at the uh, relapse-free survival of these patients. Uh, so it's not great, uh, but it's a lot better than uh, what you see with uh, patients with other, other genotypes. And, uh, there's roughly equal numbers of patients that are in the blue-yellow group on the one hand and the black group on the other. Uh, and already, uh, this type of data is having uh, substantial therapeutic uh, implications. Uh, one option for leukemia is developed uh, here in Seattle, bone marrow transplantation. Uh, it can't be done uh, during the acute phase of the disease. Uh, the patients have to be in a stable remission to have any uh, realistic chance of surviving bone marrow transplantation. Uh, but patients with these genotypes, which have uh, poor relapse-free survival, under conventional therapy are increasingly uh, choosing to undergo bone, bone marrow transplantation if, uh, if they uh, kind of meet the criteria for this uh, demanding therapy. Uh, and uh, patients with these genotypes are more likely uh, to uh, hope that they end up in the 60% or so that, uh, that have uh, stable uh, remissions or reasonably stable remissions. Uh, charts of this type could be shown for many types of cancer. The literature just in the last year or two is, has a flood of data of these type, and oncologists are uh, struggling uh, to understand how to, to deal with uh, its implications, <clears throat> but it is infusing a kind of new energy and uh, optimism into cancer research, uh, which is much needed. So, now move on to therapeutics. Uh, the therapeutics uh, I want to really emphasize. Uh, the big problem in AML is we don't have very many therapeutic options. It's true for actually most diseases, most serious diseases. We don't, it's a nice idea that genomics is going to allow very fine subdivision of 
diseases and this elaborate taxonomy, uh, but it doesn't do a lot of good uh, to, let's say, take type 2 diabetes and subdivide it into dozens and dozens of different conditions when uh, you know, there's basically only one treatment. And uh, that uh, is, a, is a challenge. We need to focus on uh, therapeutics. And some of my comments here will be a little unorthodox, but I believe we need unorthodox thinking uh, about how to uh, adjust priorities within the biomedical research enterprise uh, to increase the focus on uh, therapy and, uh, and allow, I don't want to overstate this, but allow uh, our strong suit of diagnostics uh, to evolve uh, as it will. Uh, I'm not concerned that there isn't going to be a lot of genetic, uh, genomic diagnostics done over the next uh, decades. I am concerned uh, that uh, therapeutic opportunities uh, are not going to receive enough research attention. Uh, they're more difficult, they're riskier, uh, they don't uh, fit as comfortably into the incentive systems and so forth. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk a little about therapeutics in cancer. So Gleevec is a you know, well-known uh, pre-genomic prototype for an for a, a anti-cancer drug that targets a, uh, uh, an enzyme whose activity has been elevated by a driver mutation. So this is an instance of having too much of a particular kind of, of uh, protein present in the tumors and uh, small molecule inhibitors of this uh, were developed. and. Uh, Gleevec is the uh, trade name for a, a spectacularly successful drug. Uh, around 2000, Novartis, who developed uh, Gleevec, uh, started running many ads of this type. And I, I actually knew two people that uh, sort of fit this profile. It's not so uncommon. You know, these people were dying. I mean, they were within months of death and, uh, and went into amazing remissions. Uh, I don't know of course, whether this patient is still alive, uh, but many of them are, even from this first generation of Gleevec responses. And, uh, and now, with uh, second generation uh, drugs of this type and more experience in deploying them clinically, the uh, uh, survivals uh, are, uh, are excellent and, uh, and the remissions are long term, to the point that if you read the literature of this, this form of leukemia, leukemia, CML it's called, uh, you'll see that a, you know, a major controversy today is how long should you treat patients. <coughs> These are quite powerful drugs. They, do, they don't have the side effects of traditional chemotherapy, otherwise they couldn't be tolerated long term. Uh, but they do have side effects and uh, they're starting to look at, uh, at, at patients 10 years out uh, that are healthy, have you know, no pathological trace of uh, cancer cells and it's uh, unknown you know, how long uh, they should continue to treat. Uh, this is, uh, this uh, example is uh, incessantly <laughs> cited in policy circles and for, to illustrate uh, a whole variety of lessons. One indisputable one is that this is a uh, long, slow process. The initial scientific uh, insights were uh, in the 1960s and uh, the first human results uh, reported 40 years later by this drug. And, uh, and now in 2010, this is, this is the standard of care for CML and, <coughs> and the prognosis for CML patients is spectacularly improved. How expensive is this? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's expensive. Does anyone know the actual answer to that question? Roughly what it costs per year to, to, to keep a CML patient on Gleevec? Uh, certainly tens of thousands of dollars, but uh, I'm not sure whether it's low tens of thousands or mid tens of thousands. It's expensive. Uh, and these costs, of course, they're the way that we, they're the way we allocate the costs in our healthcare system. Uh, it's not expensive to synthesize this drug, uh, to put it in bottles and so forth. It's the, uh, you know, it's the amortization of the R&D costs that are the issue. There are about 5,000 CML patients a year in the United States, so it's not a, the amortization is over a modest number of patients. I don't think Novartis has made any serious money on this drug. They may have lost money on it because the, the market is small, uh, but it put them in a, in a leading position in a very active area. It's $92,000. 92, so it's high tens of thousands. Yeah. Uh, so this has stimulated a tremendous amount of work. Uh, 
because many of these driver mutations are in the same general class of proteins that, uh, that the, uh, the elevated protein in CML is, and uh, similar kinds of small molecule drug development can be done. <clears throat> and there is actually uh, quite a lot of success uh, in, in the sense that uh, you do a genome sequencing of the tumors, you identify driver mutations, you use experimental drugs, patients respond to them. Uh, but it takes a long time and very fortunate circumstances to get from that situation uh, to a Gleevec-like uh, situation in which uh, one is uh, really getting uh, excellent outcomes for what was once a, a fairly uniformly fatal disease. So i just give one example. The literature is also full of cases of this kind. Uh, so this is a, a patient who had, uh, who had uh, this has started the experimental theory, had, therapy, had failed uh, conventional therapies for, uh, for widely disseminated melanoma, was with, uh, within uh, weeks of death, and uh, was, had a genome sequence, uh, a, a particular uh, driver mutation, which uh, was first uh, described in 2002, was, was uh, present and uh, known to be a major uh, player in melanoma progression. With an experimental drug, much of a Gleevec uh, style, there was a, a spectacular uh, remission uh, in a, a few weeks <coughs> of treatment, uh, but it wasn't stable, and that tends to be the, uh, the picture today. Uh, the interesting point and the reason I'm showing these uh, somewhat upsetting pictures is to illustrate that the, the pattern of uh, of disseminated uh, lesions in this patient uh, after relapse is essentially identical to the pattern uh, before the treatment started. And what that, that implies uh, is that there were pre-existing resistance mutations in essentially all of these metastatic uh, lesions. And uh, that uh, is going to be a major challenge. Resistance was a major challenge in the early years of Gleevec. Uh, and there were patients that went down this same depressing path, uh, but with second generation drugs, which uh, the uh, protein, the gene that goes for this protein cannot so readily uh, mutate around, uh, and with uh, different combinations of drugs that attack the same protein, uh, now we have uh, stable remissions. Uh, this is what uh, High school students. This is what uh, this is what clinical research looks like uh, during the stage when uh, you're first getting a foothold, and uh, there are uh, there's exhilaration, but there is also uh, plenty of heartache. <coughs> so I want to come back to a what some of you will know to be a kind of hobby horse of mine. Uh, I've been talking about for at least 15 years at the medical school. Uh, which is the notion that uh, genomics might be able to empower uh, less traditional approaches to drug development uh, that could lead to major advances in therapeutics. Uh, with respect to the example I just gave, the BRAF driver mutations in melanoma, there what we need is what I would call conventional drug development. And there's a lot of it going on. I will just say in passing that there are serious policy issues there. Uh, one of the major problems is that every, every major pharmaceutical company and many biotech companies are churning out these experimental drugs. It's obvious from the patient that I just showed, who's not at all untypical of the good results in these uh, early clinical trials, uh, that we're going to need to treat them with cocktails. I mean, this is the way that AIDS is, is, is now uh, you know, uniformly treated. Here's, there you have a, a virus which mutates at a ferocious uh, frequency, uh, but can control long-term uh, these infections in most patients with the right combination of drugs, basically by making it uh, less and less probable that the, the combination of mutations will occur uh, in one virus or in one cell uh, that will give resistance across the cocktail. That's what's needed in cancer is a major kind of combinatoric effort to, uh, to try to couple the genomics to this expanding repertoire of, uh, of uh, small molecule therapeutics directed against uh, driver mutations. And there are major obstacles to doing that. Sounds like a sensible idea, <coughs> but the intellectual property issues, for example, are huge. Uh, these uh, cocktails you would like to, uh, to, to 
uh, constitute involve drugs that are in the hands of various different pharmaceutical companies and uh, so sort of unclear uh, in whose interest other than the patients uh, it is to, to actually put all this together and patient interest doesn't always come first in our uh, capitalist system. But uh, here we are. Uh, I'm now going to shift gears to uh, the notion that, uh, that uh, there are other approaches to than conventional drug development and there are now I think increasing indications that their timer is, has come. So my favorite candidate's exploitation of what I call conditionally beneficial loss of function mutations, CBLOFMs. Uh, <laughs> so the notion here uh, is uh, that, uh, so we've seen one path toward uh, developing new drugs is to, uh, is to find uh, mutations that cause some disease or disease condition, uh, try to study the mechanism by which that happens and hope that, uh, that uh, some insight will emerge as to how to intervene in that. But you're, you're fighting this basic point that I made very early, is that the mutations typically uh, are interfering with protein function. Gleevec is a success story because in that instance the protein is, uh, the, the protein is overactive because of the mutation. The more common situation is that the proteins are underactive or absent. And, uh, and so uh, a drug is, on, is, a, is not going to bring back this missing function. You need some other lever. And uh, the notion of this conditionally beneficial loss of function mutations is that uh, <laughs> there are mutations which actually improve people's health or at least conditionally improve people's health. Uh, they're actually rather common. This is an old idea, and uh, just to give credit to some of my uh, predecessors, uh, this is a quote from Science in, uh, 15 years ago, which uh, captures exactly the game plan here. Identifying a loss of function gene defect, so this is a, a mutation that causes loss of protein function, that is the physiological opposite of the disease one is attempting to treat. That is, you're not studying the disease, you're studying its physiological opposite. I'll give some examples. Uh, allows to one to identify a target that is theoretically amenable to pharmacological uh, intervention. That is, sort of make a drug that will mimic the mutation and get these conditional benefits. There are actually lots of conditional <coughs> beneficial uh, mutations in the literature. These are just two uh, recent examples from the, uh, the medical literature. Uh, high bone density. This is Rick Lifton's lab that uh, analyzed this case. So this uh, just illustrates some of the issues in identifying and analyzing conditionally beneficial mutations. Is that uh, the proband, as they're called, the, the person who first called this uh, syndrome to medical and scientific attention, uh, had been in an uh, automobile accident and was uh, suffered significant trauma. He was taken into an ER and uh, x-rayed. And uh, so the first surprise is that there were no fractures because there was a lot of soft tissue damage and uh, the radiologists expected fractures. The second surprise was that the, the x-ray machine didn't seem to be working because the radiologists had never seen so much contrast between the bones and the soft tissue. There's something wrong with the, uh, the instrument. Uh, it turns out they just had very dense bones and indeed they run in, in the person's family. And, uh, but they're not brittle. Uh, the auto accident illustrated that. In fact, there was an interesting follow-up study in which someone went and interviewed all these people in this extended family and asked, you know, you know what, did, were they aware that they had these dense bones? Did it have some bad effect that they knew of? And the only consistent complaint is that they had trouble learning how to swim uh, they, uh, <laughs> could stay afloat. So this, is a, this is a German child that, uh, as far as I know, remains unique in the world. Uh, Case, who is a uh, total loss of function in a gene called myostatin, uh, which is involved in the regulation of muscle development and uh, is uh, just extremely muscular. The ch this child actually had some mild muscle contraction, spontaneous muscle contractions at, in the neonatal period, uh, but they resolve spontaneously. And now the only thing that's sort of obvious about this kid is you know, he can lift up his barbells and uh, punch it out with his pediatrician. But, uh, <laughs> So the point is that low bone density and uh, 
and various muscle wasting diseases and whatnot uh, are all physiological opposites of these conditions, and, uh, but these are loss of function mutations and they, they provide in a very direct way uh, potential targets. And I think this idea is finally, uh, is, is finally going to take serious hold. Uh, a, a very much publicized example of just the last few years was the discovery of, uh, of a genetic variant in the ECSK9 gene, a, a, a protease that interacts with the LDL receptor. Uh, the uh, loss of function, heterozygous loss of function is uh, fairly common in uh, American blacks, very rarely seen in, uh, in people of European or Asian ancestry. And as it happened in this study, uh, Helen Hobbs and her collaborators, uh, there was actually long-term outcome data on these uh, patients. So retrospectively, you could ask not just what their cholesterol levels were, for example, but, but what their uh, what the frequency was of outright uh, <coughs> cardiovascular disease. And uh, they, uh, this dramatic protection, having even heterozygous, uh, heterozygous uh, mutation in this gene uh, gives dramatic protection against heart disease. And uh, they've now tracked down uh, neither of these individuals is in the scientific literature, as near as I can tell, but they're much discussed. Uh, two homozygous individuals, and you know, they have virtually no LDL. And, uh, and they're healthy. So uh, this is a cardiologist's dream and, uh, and a biotech company's uh, kind of uh, uh, inspiration. This is an article just from this month in the New York Times. Gina Collada on the job again. Uh, so this is a factory that Amgen has uh, built. It's the largest monoclonal antibody production facility in the world. Uh, presumably, uh, to manufacture a drug for which they've not even yet uh, applied for FDA approval. So theoretically, when clinical trials are underway, uh, there's a high level of secrecy and blindedness and double blindedness and so forth. But when the, when the, uh, when the results of clinical trials are sufficiently spectacular, as they were with Gleevec, for example, and obviously are here, uh, it's impossible uh, to suppress discussion. And, uh, this uh, monoclonal antibody, which uh, uh, lowers uh, the, uh, the, the uh, concentration of this protein, the functional concentration of this protein, uh, evidently can kind of drive cholesterol in, in many patients down to arbitrarily low levels. And the main discussion now is how low it's actually safe to go. If you have someone with very high cholesterol and had a heart attack at age 40 and so forth, uh, there's a, there's a temptation to treat very aggressively, and it'll take time to figure out how aggressive is appropriate. Uh, but Amgen's confidence is clearly high uh, that uh, this is going to work. So an abstraction of all of this, uh, this is a modified version of a slide I showed at a psychiatry grand rounds uh, at least 10 years ago. Uh, the idea hasn't changed, is that uh, you know, if you consider phenotypes generally that correlate with health in some fashion, so healthier is out here and less healthy is over there, uh, we, we imagine that there are going to be uh, some distribution of genotypes. Uh, and uh, these, this is a logarithmic scale, so these are the very common ones and these are rare. So this is uh, sort of the traditional domain of the, of the uh, medical geneticist, Mendelian diseases and whatnot, and these are very intensively and productively studied. I am certainly not arguing that we should not continue the very effective study. We have a Mendelian uh, Disease Center uh, here at UW, and uh, we're learning a tremendous amount uh, by, uh, by studying these conditions. Uh, these near normal genotypes, I think is clear, have been overstudied in recent years. It's been a fashion that's a little difficult for some of us to understand uh, for attempting to learn something that's uh, diagnostically or therapeutically useful from looking at uh, near normal genotypes. Uh, but a, a really neglected frontier are these, uh, are these genotypes, like the ones that I've given examples of. A major problem in, uh, in moving the whole system in this direction is just that we don't, we don't really have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, the uh, academic medical centers had a good thing going for several centuries uh, in which they could sort of set up shop, increase their research intensiveness and so forth, and wait for very interesting subjects to appear for treatment. And uh, that, uh, that's really kind of what we do. That is, people, you know, they get sick and they, uh, they present for treatment, and some of the cases are interesting and informative. 
uh, you know, people that are just having a little trouble learning how to swim because their bones are so dense, you know, just are not showing up on our orthopedic services. And uh, we need, uh, you know, other ways of acquiring uh, these patients. But uh, the difficulty of acquiring them is not, uh, is not a reason not to move forward aggressively in this area. If we had put a small fraction of the resources uh, into this uh, initiative that we've put into studying near normal genotypes, uh, we'd be seeing uh, very impressive progress by now. <clears throat> so I'm going to close with just a few comments about policy. The precision medicine reports have uh, already been uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, a lot of discussion about the title of this uh, report, and uh, uh, Steve Galley, the chairman of pathology at Stanford, who suggested precision. Uh, none of us like personalized, which is a sort of common term. And the point here in policy areas, everything matters. You know, you death panels, you need uh, the right name uh, for whatever it is, uh, position you're taking. Uh, we wanted to emphasize that uh, that. The, the thrust of genomic medicine cannot be to go uh, back to anecdotal medicine. Here's an interesting case, different than all my other cases. I treat it different than all the other cases and so forth. Uh, and some of the discussions of personalized medicine are alarmingly of that character. Indeed, uh, there are prominent examples, which I won't go into, of, uh, of you know, much publicized instances of just this sort of anecdotal interpretation. As David Goldstein, uh, Duke uh, says every genome has a lot of narrative potential, and uh, <laughs> we are not interested in the narrative potential of the genome. Uh, we want to do taxonomy. We want to get more coherent uh, subgroups of patients and uh, to be able to target more precisely the therapies, uh, but we need a lot more therapies, and uh, it's not a minor matter uh, to redirect an enterprise as large as ours uh, in that direction. So some of the rec recommendations of this report were sort of self-evident. Uh, I've emphasized genome sequencing, but there are lots of other sources of uh, information that uh, should also be collected. Uh, but the key thing is we're going to need to study enormous numbers of patients uh, compared to past histories, Framingham-type studies and so forth. Uh, and the only option is going to be to shift towards studying patients as they're embedded in the ordinary health, uh, course of health care. It is uh, simply not an option uh, to do Framingham-type studies on 10 million patients. It is not going to happen, and uh, we uh, need to figure out uh, how to use uh, electronic medical records in the ordinary course of health care as, uh, as the kind of source of long-term follow-up on these patients. And we need uh, much more open source, open access kind of information comments. So this uh, report is full of complicated uh, sort of for fancy diagrams. They're actually not very complicated. Uh, about this information commons, knowledge network, and so forth, the only thing I really want to emphasize is that the organizing principle of this sort of Google Maps-like approach of attaching everything we know to something in Google Map, it's a, it's a latitude and longitude, here it's going to be the individual patient. That's really the key. We do not presently organize uh, what we know about uh, biomedical information around the individual patient. We organize it in all sorts of other ways. Uh, going forward, the patient is going to rule. We're going to need millions of patients, and we're going to be able to organize a lot of information around them. Uh, the uh, co-chair of the Precision, Me Precision Medicine Report, uh, Sue Desmond Hellman, who's chancellor of UCSF, was a major player while at Genentech in the develop uh, development of Herceptin, uh, which is a you know, ver very effective uh, genomic medicine uh, for treating uh, various types of cancer, especially breast cancer. Uh, I think stated this very well in, a, in, a, uh, in an editorial in Science Translational Medicine, that uh, what we need is kind of a new social contract in which patients both contribute personal clinical data and benefit from the knowledge gained through the collaboration. We, we've sort of created a system in which the model is that the, you know, the patient shows up and gets stuff from the academic medical center. And, uh, you know, if we're lucky, we might be able to enroll someone in a, a particularly interesting case in some clinical trial and so forth. But it's not thought of as a social contract uh, in which uh, the quality of what uh, the patient gets out of the healthcare system depends on what they, their willingness to put information into it. I, I believe the public can be uh, educated along these lines and that uh, we need to uh, start that process. 
there are, of course, immense challenges associated with privacy and, uh, and many other issues, incidental findings and so forth. But uh, uh, we start. Uh, my two injunctions as we leave is that uh, we don't need the hype. We never needed the hype uh, in genomic medicine, and we most assuredly don't need it now. We have real stuff to talk about. Um, this is just a sort of a dot-com era example. The hype got fairly extreme. Uh, at the top of this ladder is a world without disease and so forth. Uh, this is a, we don't need this. It doesn't help us. Um, we have a solid product to sell. Uh, and the other injunction is we, uh, we need to build the commons. And my view is that uh, business as usual is actually not going to get us there. Uh, there are many obstacles, uh, but uh, it's good we have some young people here, and uh, we need uh, to sort of gradually uh, not take no for an answer. Uh, this is, I think, the, the path, and, uh, and I think the benefits will be uh, substantial. Thank you. So do we have any high school students that are uh, brave enough to ask a question here? No. I don't want to put them on we, this. We can take a few questions huh? now, and, and we also serve for questions afterwards, and, and maybe we'll stick around for a little bit and answer additional questions if we have them. But if people have a few questions now, go ahead and ask. Not a high school student, but we'll start here. Uh, for a layperson, could you talk a little bit about biochemical pathways? I've seen these big charts. Yeah. And uh, the second question is, um, the Institute of Systems Biology, how close are they to realizing their potential with the yeah. four Ps? Yeah, so you know, I can't comment you know, about, the, about the Institute itself, uh, but uh, you know, it's pretty obvious from the way that I framed my discussion tonight that I'm a skeptic uh, that systems biology is ready to have much impact on the way that we deal with uh, these issues, because, and it's because I think the problems are, there are a lot of interesting things happening in systems biology, but if, if, if you even take the mutations that we sort of think we understand the best, uh, you know, say cystic fibrosis, uh, we, 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 we have absolutely no ability, no ability whatsoever uh, to, to, to predict because this particular ion channel is mutated in these kids, that they would end up with a disease with these very complex kinds of characteristics that CF has. And the same thing applies pretty much across the board. Take BRCA1, Mary Claire may want to speak up here, but uh, I'll take the risk uh, of, uh, of saying a, a fairly standard thing, which is, so we actually, after what, 15 years of uh, very hard work, we actually have a reasonable idea, you know, why mutations in BRCA1 might, might, might uh, increase uh, cancer risk, but a very poor understanding of the tissue specificity, you know, why this is breast cancer and not various other kinds of cancer. And those, you know, those are the simplest kinds of questions, you know, you, to, to try to put it all into some very complex kind of engineering type system, I just think is, uh, is not, not, not going to happen anytime soon. It doesn't mean there aren't interesting things to do with systems methods, but I don't think this is one of them. The uh, metabolic pathways is, uh, you know, that uh, we're getting better at them. You know, the charts were already complicated when I was a student. That's one reason I went into inorganic chemistry instead of biochemistry. <laughs> Those charts were too complicated for me. Uh, they've gotten a lot more complicated, mostly because we have not actually discovered a whole lot of new pathways uh, since I was a graduate student. Uh, but we've, you know, come to understand the complexity of many of the pathways uh, to a sobering degree. Uh, for example, there are often, our, well, we used to think there was one enzyme that got you from here to here. You know, we now know there are 40, and, uh, and that some are expressed in the pancreas, you know, during the first trimester of pregnancy and so forth. Uh, a very complicated situation. Uh, and uh, this is a critical knowledge. I mean, my Beery twin example, uh, the, uh, the uh, inference from the genome sequence to the therapeutic depended on knowing in considerable detail how dopamine and serotonin are made, and uh, many, many applications are of that nature. Uh, we, you know, genomicists love biochemistry. Uh, 
It's just a field that progresses more slowly than we would like to see it. <laughs> we, just, we don't, you know, just don't learn that much new. Uh, and, uh, but we get as much mileage as we can out of what we've got. So, please. Uh, back there, yeah. So if I understand the question, it, it has to do with, uh, you know, is, this, uh, is moving, moving down this path likely to increase health inequities? And is it that the type, type of concern? Yeah. That, uh, you know, we already have a, that sounds expensive and uh, involves a lot of really special, specialty medicine uh, and so forth. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, the berries were, were uh, you know, uh, upper middle class, highly educated family that, you know, knew how to go out and get the best they could for their kids and had the resources to do it. Um, it's a, you know, it's, it's a concern. I, I suspect, it, you know, my reading of the history of medicine is that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, relatively well-off, well-connected, well-educated people have always been uh, the first adopters and the first uh, beneficiaries of major medical advances, and, uh, and that'll probably, uh, probably happen here too, uh, which you know, means that you know, we need to uh, use uh, explicit mechanisms to try to compensate for, for that, that, that natural effect. The, the, you know, the PCSK9 story is quite interesting because this, uh, you know, the African American population is certainly understudied uh, genetically particularly because it's genetically more complex than, than individuals of either European or Asian ancestry. And uh, this is, a, you know, this is an, a West African founder effect mutation that uh, underlies this phenomenon. And it, it, you know, there happened to have been a study in uh, Dallas, I believe, that uh, had done this long-term follow-up uh, and had uh, major African-American participation. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening. Uh, so, we uh, would like to have the, it, it is indeed critical from a basic science point of view, as well as a social justice point of view, that there be uh, intensive study of the, all of the diversity of the population. The U.S. should try to turn this to its advantage. Uh, and we're, we're a rich enough country that we could if we had the will. Uh, you know, it's great to study uh, the Icelandic population. Uh, we're going to go to the Faroe Islands in September, where they have an even more uh, narrow kind of uh, population. And uh, there, there are major benefits to doing that, uh, but uh, they are outweighed by the, the benefits of studying very diverse populations. The latter activity is just much more expensive and uh, more challenging, but that, that's our society and that's the way we should go. Uh, Back there. Yeah. I didn't quite get the, uh, the, the who will play. That citizen science. Citizen science, uh huh. So this is, you know, posting your health records on the web and finding a similar group of patients and. No. Wet uh, lab experiments, yeah, well, um, I would defer to you about that subject. I, uh, I think that, the, uh, that you know, most of the people in this room, and most of the graduate students here don't even do wet lab experiments anymore. They just uh, sit at a computer terminal and analyze data. And uh, so I, I think wet lab experimentation is going to become actually a more rarefied activity even in academic medicine. And so I'm, I'm skeptical that there's going to be an outgrowth of uh, citizen science in this area. What I'm sure we'll see happen, and we're already seeing happen, is that at the more informational level, uh, these uh, you know, so-called disease interest groups, you know, the groups of spontaneously assembled groups of people that care deeply about some potentially rare disease, uh, they share information. And uh, that will include genome sequences and clinical information and lots of information. And, uh, and that we'll start to see uh, that to be a, a substantial force and could indeed become a 
creative, creative one. I mean, people are cynical about like the Lorenzo's oil kind of stories uh, because they often don't hold up to uh, close scrutiny. Uh, but a lot of stuff that we do doesn't either. And uh, <laughs> as the groups get bigger that are sharing data and uh, more uh, disciplined and so forth, uh, we may see uh, significant citizen activity. That, uh, but I doubt that they're going to be doing a lot of wet lab experiments. So just my my guess. So we uh, we're going to have a yeah, so reception. Yeah.